People are communal beings. We learn from each other over time, which traits and patterns and the resources around us help lead to success and survival. Our ancestors taught us which berries we can eat and those that we shouldn't. They taught us which materials would be good for building shelter. And ultimately, they taught us which personality traits would lead to tribal success. And leaning on these lessons learned from our ancestors is good. It helps us to survive as long as the resources stay the same. But it won't help us to thrive when the resources change. And the truth is, the resources have changed. The types of foods that we're exposed to have evolved. The amount of materials we're able to use to build shelter has greatly changed. And yes, even the people have changed. In 1937, there was a major corporation, and they launched their first product in the product line. And when it was launched, it was a huge success. People traveled from all over to come be part of the first experience. It was so successful that this corporation decided that if they would release another two to three products per year in this product line, it would garner a lot of profit. And so they did. They've continued to release products in this product line every year from 1937 still through today. And there was a few things that continued to lead to their success. Number one. They relied on a certain thematic element in their product that hit really well with the market. The market liked it, they did really well, they said let's continue using this, right? It was proven. Number two, they found that if they hired most of their staff from a particular university that was well renowned in their field, they did really well. It was good technical skills. They liked the way they produced the product. And number three, they always chose to select males for the director position. And you can say this works for them. I mean they were highly successful. Competition could not touch them, right? It's like they created this gold standard of success. And why not keep doing it if it worked? Well, the problem is, is that nobody realized they would be able to outperform themselves if they changed a few things. And in 2012, they hired their first female director, someone who did not look, act, sound, behave like the former directors. And she was from a different university. She exhibited different technical skills that they weren't quite used to. And that thematic element that they relied on for their products that proved their profit margin, she said, yeah, I want to change that. I think if we flip it on its head, we'll do better. And they trusted and they respected her input, and she greatly influenced the way the product was developed. And when that product was released in 2013, it garnered $1.2 billion. In fact, it was so successful that 80% of you in this room are consumers of it. And those who aren't will likely be after this talk. <laughs> what was that product? Their product was Disney's animated feature film, Frozen. Mm -hmm. Frozen is so successful that they translated it into over 40 different languages. The only other Disney film that held their rank before that was Frozen in 1995. It was Lion King. It took 18 years for them to outperform themselves. And when they did with Frozen, they did it by 30% of a profit margin. It was huge. The woman they selected to co-write and co-direct this film, Jennifer Lee. She challenged a lot of the ways that they did things. She chose to be more empathetic with the characters. She chose to humanize the characters. And it went over really well when it was released. How many of you are familiar with this children's toy? I know for me it's one of my favorite, and I tend to buy it for my friends when they have kids. It's a game where the objective is to get the toy to pass through the shape of the filter and into the box. That's the goal. And children learn over time that the more closely the shape the toy matches the shape of the filter, the higher the success rate. Now, what if this toy wasn't about children? <clears throat> what if it was about the way that we hire and promote in corporations? then it would look something like this. When corporations started taking off, the only allowed eligible candidates were white males. So the white males showed up, and everyone else was turned away. And so corporations had to decipher a filter that would identify which white males from the application pool they would hire. So they put together a filter of those traits that they were looking for, and they hired people. And these people moved into team lead positions, supervisors, and over time, Corporations started noticing certain traits in these white males that led to success. Traits like 
being assertive, being self-promoting, being outspoken, even hype sometimes. And so they said, we want to replicate these traits. These are the traits of those who will be our future executives. Those are the traits of those who will be the future senior professionals, the senior experts. So they created a filter to help identify for it. And then they promoted their executives and their senior level positions. And the world looked at this in about the mid-1900s and said, something's wrong here. Um, there's a whole lot more people in the population, and we need to hire women and minorities too. They deserve a place in these corporations. They deserve to have equal job opportunities. And so corporations said, okay, we'll hire them, but obviously we have to change our entry-level template to make space for them. And so they changed it. People got hired. And as time went on, people got promoted based on their leadership skills, their talents. And we look around the room and we say, why aren't there more minorities and women in executive level positions, in leadership positions, and senior expert positions? And it's because no one changed this leadership filter. So you see, this filter is based on strong traits exhibited by white males, but it does not help identify strong traits in females or minorities. And so we've all been taught inclusion and diversity. We must have diversity. How do we ensure that we have it? And so we created a quota. And we went out and said, please go find somebody who looks kind of like this filter. I know they won't be an exact match, but at least they'll get the job done. And we have diversity, and that'll be good. So they go out and they find someone, and they promote them to this position. And the problem with this process is that when this person gets promoted, People look at that person and they say, they got that job because they're lucky. They got that job because they meet that quota. And when that person tries to apply their skills that look a little bit different than what came before, people discredit them. Why? Because it doesn't look like what people have been taught success looks like. 2011, Google set out, set out to do a study. Their goal was to find out which attributes and teams led to the greatest profit margins. And like most of us, they thought it would be those who walk in with a singular goal. It would be those who walk in with a very strict agenda. It would be those who keep their teammates on focus and walk out with goals and walk out with deadlines and action items, right? That's what we like to do. We say that gets the job done, we'll be profitable. Wrong. Google thought that's what they would find, and they were boggled to find out that that wasn't the case. And they had to increase their studies and observe people. And what they found is that the traits that led to higher success rates overall across their teams, the teams that had the greatest profit, were the teams that exhibited empathy, better listening skills, better collaboration. In fact, teams who talked about their feelings. So what if our template for success was to be revamped? What if we chose to go and identify, respect, and promote traits that look different than we're used to, because the fact is, the people have changed. It would look something like this. When you change the leadership template, when you change the template for those that we respect for their technical expertise, more women and minorities get promoted into middle level and entry level positions. Why? Because they look like the ultimate leadership, the ultimate, ultimate skills that we're looking for. And as expectation goes, more women and minorities will move into senior management. And this doesn't just benefit the women and minorities. It benefits all of us. Because the fact is, these resources and these skills are available to us today, but we've been overlooking them. I'm an extrovert. I've been an extrovert my whole life. I've not chosen to convert. <laughs> and when I was raised, my parents told me, it's so great that you're an extrovert, because extroverts rule the world. They're the ones who are able to better express their ideas. They're the ones who are able to be better leaders. And if introverts ever want to get their ideas out there, well, they better get up the guts to do it, because no one's going to wait around. And as a child, I thought, this is great. I'm an extrovert. I'm the supreme personality. I don't have to change, right? Everyone will like me. And then it wasn't until one year ago that I was having dinner with a friend, and I realized all we talked about were subjects I picked up. And I realized what was happening is she had a lot of value to add 
she had a lot of interesting things to talk about, but I never got to hear about it because I was always talking over her. And so I pulled aside a good colleague of mine at work, and I said, hey, um, you're an introvert. He's like, yeah. And I said, well, I have a problem. I'm an extrovert. And I have this problem where I tend to talk over my peers and my colleagues. And I think there's a lot of benefit to what they have to say. And he said, Kelsey, it's not that you don't value what introverts have to say or their input. The problem is you don't like an awkward silence. And I said, that's why it's called awkward? Um, nobody likes an awkward silence. And he said, no, no, no. Kelsey, only you don't like an awkward silence. To the introverts, it's just silence. That's the time that we use to cultivate, and brainstorm, and draw up our brilliant ideas. But people like you will never get to hear about them if you keep speaking over us. And from that day forward, I decided to embrace the non-awkward silence. And I have been all the better for it because I have gained so much more from my introverted colleagues and my friends. When Frozen was created, it was about two princesses. The older one, Elsa, and the younger one, Anna. And Elsa manifested a magical power to create ice and snow. And when her parents saw this, they said, this is strange, it's harmful, it's detrimental, it's unusual, it must be suppressed. Why can't you just act like everyone else? Suppress it, suppress it, suppress it. And so she did, for as long as she could, until one day her powers accidentally came out. And when they did, the community was very fearful of it. They said, this is weird, this is, wor this is worrisome. And she was cast out of the community, and she fled to the countryside. And when she was there, she was free of suppression. She was free of doubt. She was free of criticism. And when she did that, she was able to build the most magnificent castle made of ice. The problem was only she was able to enjoy it. And it wasn't until her younger sister, Anna, went out seeking after her and said, I think that your ability to create ice and snow is good. I think it can be useful. Can you please return home? And through an interchange of events, Elsa finally made it back to the kingdom. And when she did, with some support from Anna, all of a sudden, her skills and ability to create ice and snow became a great asset to the community. Now notice, nothing changed about Elsa's powers. Her powers when she was a kid to create ice and snow was always there. What changed was the world's perception of whether or not her skills were a detriment or an asset. How many times have we overlooked good talent because it was unusual, because it was different? because it came with an accent, because we didn't recognize it, because they don't walk the way we walk, because they don't dress the way we walk. Their family values are different from us. How many times have we cast out talent and said, you really got to work on that, because what you really do is look like the rest of the people that are successful. And how many people have left and went and created magnificent, beautiful ice castles? And we could have reaped the benefits from that, but we didn't see it as something powerful. We didn't see it as an asset. When you walked into this room, I did not limit you. I did not limit you in how you would interpret this talk. I did not limit you in how or when you would like to apply it. And when you leave this room, I ask that you please do not limit others. Thank you.